Donald Trump has wasted no time in turning his Georgia mugshot into a multi-million dollar fundraising strategy. His re-election campaign has slapped it on coffee mugs and t-shirts and posters and coolers because there is nothing like reaching for a cold six-pack and coming face-to-face -face with the former president's booking shot at least when I'm on the beach. Aside from the merch madness, the campaign is now emailing supporters and asking them to donate $35 to help save America from Joe Biden. In return for that support, a limited edition mugshot poster signed by the former president. But supporters can also just go to the campaign website and buy what appears to be the same signed poster for $7 less. Now, the difference in price there may be because of the postage required to send emails. Wait a second. In any case, Trump's campaign says it has raised $9 million since that mugshot was taken. And it is celebrating Trump's status as the top choice in the 2024 Republican field among nearly 60 percent of GOP primary voters. Despite the fact that he is facing 91 felony charges across four different jurisdictions. So... How does his opponent, Joe Biden, the current president and candidate, manage Trump and his mugshot coolers and his laundry list of indictments? And most urgently, how does Joe Biden, the president, govern in a post-Trump world and maybe even a pre-Trump one, too? I have just the right person to ask. Joining me now is Franklin Four, staff writer at The Atlantic and author of the new book, Out Today, The Last Politician, Inside Joe Biden's White House and the Struggle for America's Future, which is an illuminating, compelling account of the first two years of the Biden presidency. Frank, it is great to see you. Congratulations on publishing Thank day. You. Thank, Thank you for you. joining Thank me you. on set, my Thank friend. You. Thank you. First, I just, I kind of wonder what you gleaned. I mean, as, as we're going to talk a lot about Biden the president, but just as, as, a, as a political animal, um, his appetite for going into this race again for the umpteenth time with potentially even more on the line and just how, how ferocious that appetite is and how much is born out of a sense of duty. Well, I think he beat Donald Trump in 2020. Yeah. And if Trump wasn't running this election, if Trump had was incarcerated or if Trump had decided that he was going to hang it up, um, then I'm sure Biden's calculus going into this next election would be probably a little bit different. Yeah. But because he views this as an existential thing and because he's got this track record and because I think in his own mind, he's arrived at this conclusion that he is the safest bet in a race. Against does, does he think he's the safest bet? I'm pretty <laughs> sure he does. Because it's a sort of... I, I don't self aggrand I mean, not self aggrandizing It's a, sort of a self-flagellating sort of thing. I'm the safest guy, so therefore I'm going to take up the mantle. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that people who do the job that he does yeah. inevitably come to, to, to view themselves as being indispensable on some level. Yeah. Right? And, you know, I think it's really interesting to consider what would be the counterfactual yeah. if Biden in the middle of his term had decided he wasn't going to run, you'd have this free for all of a Democratic primary. Who knows what way that would go? Who knows what issues that would dredge up for the Democrats? Um, who knows how they would run against the current president? And he, any president makes a calculation about running for re-election when they make that announcement and how that has the implications that it has for their domestic agenda as it unfolds. And the real interesting thing for Joe Biden and what I chronicle in my book is that he's had, I think, a pretty successful first term. He's gotten a lot done. Yeah. But his legacy at the end of the day. Yeah turns on the question of how he performs in the 2024 election. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I got to think, as Biden, who seems so unwavering in his fundamental belief of the goodness and decency of the American people, right? That seems like it's part of his DNA at this point. But it's actually been a journey for him. It's, it's an interesting part of the story. So when he came into office, he, he, his, his inauguration happens in the shadow of January yeah. 6th. And the very scene of the insurrection, I mean, it's just if you go back to that moment and how crazy it is to consider that he inherited this nation at that moment in time. And part of his agenda was trying to cool the nation down. Yeah. And we were dominated by politics. And he intentionally, I think, started to recede a little bit and, and, and to allow the nation to breathe again. Mm -hmm. And want it. And I, I, it feels like that wasn't just a sort of posture he adopted, but that almost felt like a directive to his 
his cabinet members. I mean, the fact, for example, that Merrick Garland didn't try and prosecute, you know, that, that there was not, at least from the reporting we have, a robust attempt inside the upper echelons of the Department of Justice to hold accountable the, the generals of the January 6th insurrection until Congress really put some pressure on the DOJ seems to me an extension of Biden just really wanting to let that chapter fade into the rear view and not have to relitigate it. And yet here right. it is on his doorstep as right. he makes another run for well, the presidency. So he, he wouldn't refer to Trump by name initially. Trump was Voldemort. He was the former guy, right? Yeah. And the, he whose name should not be invoked. And that worked. That was his strategy for a while. And it's also important to remember that happens while he's trying to get the nation to take the vaccine. Yes. And so it's impossible to disentangle that from the pandemic response. And his big challenge was persuading the unpersuadable. Um, and then by the end of his first year, he his, his view evolves from um, one where he's talking about the better angels to one where he's making this big push on voting rights. And he compares the opponents of voting rights to Bull Connor, in effect, comparing Joe Manchin, Mitch McConnell, all these people who were his colleagues and friends to Bull Connor. And he takes this much more aggressive, bleak view of the American condition at that moment. But would you and and I, 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 I know you can't jump inside the mind of Joe Biden. I remember that speech where he really starts calling out MAGA Republicans, but he's still doing this thing where he's trying to excise the poison from the broader body politic, where he's suggesting that MAGAism and Trumpism is a virus, but it has not overtaken the host. And it seems like he still believes that there is a fundamental decency in America and a fundamental decency even inside the Republican Party. I mean, right. Is that fairly accurate? And uh, if I it think is, be, yeah, I think it would be hard to be president of the United States and not believe in the fundamental <laughs> decency of well, the Ameri and the but, Republican Party specifically. Yeah. Well, uh, there he's been careful. And he's uh, so to give him credit, um, he held out hope that he could pass bipartisan things by working with this group of 10 or so senators who were ambivalent about Trump, who clearly behind the scenes wanted to be rid of Trump, but were reluctant to challenge him in public. And so Biden starts talking about the ultra MAGA Republicans. That, right. was, that was his phrase, ultra MAGA, when he got the focus group reports and he was looking at this. And it was in order to emphasize that distinction. And indeed, after he, coining that term and, and framing things in that way, he got the chips bill passed. He got gun legislation passed. He got a whole, the pact bill. The a extension. lot of stuff passed. Yeah. I mean, we have a lot to talk about, so we're going to take a quick break, but I do want to ask you about how in, how Joe Biden, who still believes in the decency of the American public and the, the decency of Republicans who are not ultra MAGA, that he's running neck and neck in a poll 46 to 46 with Donald Trump. So stay tuned. We have much more to discuss. When Biden sees himself tied neck and neck in a poll, at 4646 with Trump in a matchup for 2024. Of course, this is poll is just a snapshot and a moment in time, and yeah. I don't want to put any more weight on it. But I would assume that enter that that I would I can't imagine being Joe Biden, who has worked so hard to be so diligent and preserve institutions and see himself in a head to head against someone with 91 felony counts. Yeah. And that the American public is split down the middle on the two of them. Yeah. I mean, that's got to be a hard thing to look at. Um, do you think he understands Trump's? I mean, do you think he in some way respects Trump's appeal to the base? I just wonder how you think of no, him. No, I think that in, at the end of the day, he thinks that Trump is kind of a malignant bully. I don't think that there's any hedging on that. And he's been he's been consistent and clear in yes. public on that. But he is also consistent and clear about trying to win back parts of the Republican Party that have otherwise been forsaken. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's that's been that's been his strategy. Right. And I well. In, as we talk about the way in which he governs in the next two years and maybe the next six, if he's lucky and wins re-election, do you think that the Biden White House has learned a, any particular lesson about how to sell its message to the American public, given the pretty outstanding number of legislative accomplishments they've had with the thinnest of majorities? So this weekend, he gives this Labor Day speech, which is the first time that he frames things in a populist sort of way. One of the mysteries to me about the Biden presidency is that so much of their agenda delivers on all of these things that Trump has talked about, whether it is trade or going hard against monopoly or infrastructure. 
uh, he's he hasn't framed things in a way where he paints the Republican Party as an elitist, phony, baloney party. And, yeah. and this is the first time that he's done that. And it does connect in the end of the day to Trump believing that he's above the law. The whole thing is a scam. And Biden has to present himself as the one who's genuinely delivered on all this stuff that they talk about. Well, he has a lot of talking and speaking to do. I couldn't even get to the part about the Dobbs decision, but that is something the Democrats want to run on. But you detail the real crisis of conscience that Biden has as a Catholic about going full bore on reproductive freedoms. I think that that has changed over time. When Dobbs dropped, I think it took him a long time. And this is consistent with some of the themes that we're talking about. I think it took him a while to understand the radicalism of the Dobbs decision and the radicalism of the Republican Party's approach yeah. to abortion. We're not in a 1980s, 1990s debate here about limits on abortion. This is about eradication. And so it took the case of that 10-year-old girl to really in Ohio. drive it home for Biden. And I think he hasn't had too many doubts about it since then.